Hello guys, welcome back. In the first part of today's lecture, we have uh, talked about some basic information about research ethics, which we talk about the definition of what research ethics is. And we have also talked about why we need to conduct, um, well, we need to actually consider the research ethics. Okay. In the second part of today's lecture, we will look at some of the ethical obligations. And I have summarized those obligations into four categories, as you will find it in the lecture slides. Okay, we will go to each of these four. The first one is the obligation to uh, society. The, um, well, for any research that we conduct, no matter which country we are based as a researcher or as a company employee or as anyone who, who conduct the research under whatever circumstances you are, we should um, obey the law in the country that we are. And this is especially the case when you cooperate with other researchers across different nation nationalities or across different laws. We need to make sure that um, the research that we conduct uh, follow the instructions of the laws in all those countries. Okay. Um, I think this is quite straightforward, isn't it? It's quite easy to understand that we should obey the law um, no matter what we're doing. And here we're talking about conducting a research. We need to obey the law. Okay. And there are some reflexivity involved as well. Um, under the law terms there are things that we should not do of course but there are some gray areas as well on um, you know what we do is probably not against the law but still would um, would be creating problems to the society so we are so when we are conducting a research we should not only consider the fixed law term but also considering what would be the circumstances to uh, what would be the outcome to the society if we conduct certain research okay um the second category of um, the research the ethical allegation is to research participants I think this is probably the most common category that we would consider when we are conducting a research, which is to protect our research participants from any kind of harm. Here I put a question in the box in the middle of this slide there saying, does harm refer to physical harm alone? Well, I really wish that we are in a face-to-face um, teaching environment where I would get a chance to know what you think. Well, under the current circumstances, I could only um, invite you to think by yourselves on um, this question. Does harm refer to physical harm alone? I would give you 10 seconds, okay, to think about it. Um, I'm sure you probably would have a quick answer, but think about what are the other forms of harm, okay? Okay, that's about 10 seconds. Um, if you need more time, please pause the video and continue your thought on 
what are the what could be the other types of form that a research may bring to a research participant and now i'm going to I give you my answers okay and um, so as you can see from the slides there a harm could include the physical format of the harm and also it can include any harm to the participants development their personal development their mental health well-being and uh, whether doing such a uh, research may bring any stress to the participants or may harm their self-esteem and how about their career prospects for example and um, what if such information mentioned by a participant may make them into a very vulnerable place that you know if their boss knows what they think they may have trouble and they may get less opportunity as compared with their colleagues or they may get you know they, they may put themselves into a kind of disadvantaged position when they are uh, competing on a promotion opportunity for example once their boss knows what their true thoughts is so we do need to consider what may bring to these participants if we include their data in our research and these are some more kind of hidden um, harm to the participants compared with those physical form of harm and another thing that we usually should take into account is to protect the research participants' right. That will include their right to join your research project, to withdraw from your research project, and how the data can how their data would be used, and where, for example, whether their name would be anonymized, and whether their job title would be anonymized, for example, and what what information you know what sensitive information that we can gather and use in our research so those are the things that we need to consider i put a stick note there and um, referring to um, the research participants right for you to think about uh, which is on to what extent will your research participants know and understand what your research is involved or what kind of data is involved and and how they feel that they can freely to choose to take part in your research project or to withdraw from your research project and and this part of it we will talk about it in more detail in um, informed consent and um, in our next part of the lecture and the final point about research participants is uh, when we are researching a vulnerable group a vulnerable group a vulnerable vulnerable group and um, be careful of uh, you know be more sensitive on what can be a vulnerable group a typical uh, kind of vulnerable group would be when we are researching uh, non-adults like when we are dealing with children and these are quite kind of typical uh, type of vulnerable group but we have other types of vulnerable group for example um, if you are researching on sex workers or if you're researching on illegal migrant workers and or even for those legal migrant workers or workers and some some of um, those participants you may you may not feel that they are vulnerable but they are for example if you research on uber drivers 
Um, well, in, in some cases they are not vulnerable, but in some cases they could be vulnerable depending on um, whether our research would bring problem to them, uh, bring any type of harm to them. Okay, right. So this is to make you aware that some, you know, uh, groups who look like they're not vulnerable could be vulnerable so be um, reflective on who your research participants are and what kind of harm or what kind of harm that we may bring to them and be careful when we design our research okay a third category is about sponsors funders or clients um, some some of the students may think, well, that doesn't sound relevant to to my study. Um, I, I I don't have any sponsor or I don't have any funder um, for my dissertation. Um, but that that may, <laughs> that could be the case. But in some cases, um, when you are doing your dissertation, um, we do have some project from uh, from some companies uh, who would invite our students to their company to try to solve a certain problem that their company have. Um, it could be looking at um, trying to explore the reasons why a certain issue is occurred in that company for example why this company is suffering from a high absent absenteeism uh, or uh, try to evaluate uh, how effective an hr policy is after implementing that hr policy or it could be uh, trying to find a solution on again on, on a certain problem um, so that that is for your dissertation and well for this lecture we are not only thinking about your dissertation we are also thinking about any other type of research that you may do in the future so after you graduate from here you may also do research uh, either for your employer your company or if you work as a consultant it is quite common for you to try to solve your client's problems. So you would have a client who would hire you um, through, well, whether if you are independent consultant, they, they would hire you directly, or if you are based on a consulting company, they, 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 would, hire, they would hire you to, or your, your consulting company would ask you to carried out the research for your clients. So no matter under what, which circumstances that we mentioned um, just now, um, when you have any kind of sponsor, either paid or unpaid, um, or a client, there are a couple of things that we need to take into account before we conduct the research. That would include to clarify both your responsibilities as well as your rights. So what, what right do you have as a researcher? And do you have the freedom to publish? Um, especially if you are an independent consultant, you may think about you know, publishing your research outcome to, to public or uh, to attract some future clients. You may want to publish your research outcome on your uh, Facebook account or any, any other type of uh, social media platform uh, or your, on your own web page. Um, responsibilities, what kind of responsibilities that you have? Do you, should you also be involved in the decision making process? Um, if, if, you know, if you are trying to solve a certain problem for a company and what about um, there is sensitive data about your research participants 
should I expose, should you expose the sensitive data to your sponsor or to your client? These are the things that we should negotiate with our sponsor or clients before we start to conduct the research. These are very important. It will be too late if you if you're already in the middle of your research and you have encountered with some ethical issues such as um, you're not sure whether you should expose the data or even if you don't expose the, expose the data, some of the managers would be able to guess who the research uh, participants are and, and those research participants could be in trouble and if you continue your research. So those should be um, discussed between you and the sponsor or the client before you start any kind of research. And finally, to you, to your colleague or to other scholars, of course, uh, we should not only protect our participants, you should also make sure that you yourself and uh, all your co-authors, co-researchers should also be protected from any uh, kind of harm. To be able to do that, uh, we should make sure that all the researchers involved in the research project are properly trained and we should maintain a very high research integrity that would include that we do not misinterpret our research findings and we should be honest about um, our research, our data, and we should be honest about who the authors are, who has helped us on the research project, who the research participants are, do, do not make any fake information on the research participants, on your data, and on um, the authorship, like the distribution of, of the tasks, and, and make proper attribution of ideas of, you know, the research ideas come from this research and not from mine. So we need to properly acknowledge that. This is also a part of the um, ethical um, guideline that we should follow. And here I put two stakers, which are the two commonly followed mechanism. One is to work through a risk assessment form or um, a ethical review form where we could list out all the potential uh, ethical issues that we think we may encounter before we start a research. And another commonly practiced mechanism is to follow the referencing guidelines to acknowledge the contribution from our colleagues and from other uh, scholars involved. Okay. So these are the four ethical ob obligations. To sum up, um, we have ethical obligations to the society and the law, to the research participants. We need to protect their rights, protect them from any harm, um, and um, protect the vulnerable groups to the sponsors and the clients, make sure that we negotiate our responsibilities, our rights, before we conduct any research. And to you as a researcher, to the colleagues and other um, previous scholars that you have cited. Okay, so these four are the research obligations that we should consider. In the next part of the lecture, I will talk about the actual, you know, nitty gritty things that we should take into account when we are conducting research. I'll see you in the next part.